And now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. But I'll turn just briefly to the constants of nature because this affects the electric universe or indeed any model of the universe. Um, it's assumed that the constants of nature are constant, the fundamental constants like Newton's gravitational constant, big G, or the speed of light, C. Well, I began to wonder whether they really were constant when I got into the habit view of nature. Um, and so I tried to find out what the actual values were. Uh, I started off by getting handbooks of physical constants uh, and looking at old editions. Most people only look at the latest edition but I, and they usually throw the old ones away but I, in the patent office library in London I found they kept them all and so I got them all out of the reserve stock uh, at 10 year, at ten year intervals. They wheeled in a trolley of handbooks of physical constant, dusting them off and I looked through these things to see uh, how they changed. To my amazement, I found that the speed of light dropped by 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945. I then looked up the data in more detail and found that all over the world, people have been getting this much lower figure with very small error bars. The original figure was up there with little error bars, and it goes down much lower with little error bars. It wasn't as if the error bars were 20 kilometers per second. No, they were f point decimal places of kilometers per second. Um, <clears throat> I checked in the primary literature and found this indeed seemed to be the case. And then they went up again after 1945. I couldn't understand what was going on, so I asked the head of the metrology department, metrologists are the people who measure constants, at the British National Physical Laboratory if I could go and see him. And I went to visit him. He was very friendly. And I said to him, uh, Dr. Petley, uh, I'd like to know how you explain this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945. Um, and he said, oh dear. I said, what? And he said, you've uncovered one of the most embarrassing incidents in the history of our subject. <coughs> uh, so, so I said, well, could it mean that the speed of light really did drop, at least as measured on Earth during that period? He said, oh, of course not. And I said, why not? He said, because it's a constant. <laughs> and, so I said, well, then, I can't see any other explanation than that people all around the world were sort of fudging their results uh, to get what they thought everyone else would expect them to get and then discarding outliers and stuff and, 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 and coming up with these very, these very, the very narrow error, error bars that agreed with everyone else. And so it, then it must have been produced by some kind of fudging process. He said, we don't like to use the word fudge. <laughs> and so, so I said, what do you prefer? And, uh, he said, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. <laughs> um, so I said to him, well, if it was happening then, how do we know it's not happening now? And he said, oh, we know it's not happening now. And I said, why? He said, because we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, it might still vary. And he leaned back, looking very smug, and said, well, if it did, no one would ever find out, because we've defined, we've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. 
so the units would vary with it. So I said, well, okay, you fixed that one, but what about the gravitational constant? I said, that's been varying wildly, um, and even actually in the last three, three or four years, it's varied by more than 1.3% as measured in different laboratories. And the usual assumption is this is just error, and it's experimental error, it's hard to measure, it's uh, error. Um, so labs all over the world get quite different results, and the International Committee on Metrology um, fixes the results every few years by averaging ones from different labs, weighting ones they think are more reliable, discarding ones they think are not. Um, and indeed, when I left Dr. Peckley, thanking him for his time, he reached down to a cardboard box beside his desk full of pamphlets. He said, by the way, these have just come from the printers. You might like one. He handed me this pamphlet, the latest values of the physical constants. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, um, so... Um, I, I looked at these data from different labs on G, big G, and in one or two, uh, the question that I was wondering is, there's all these big errors, could it be that they're actually changing together in different labs as the Earth rotates around the Sun, as it rotates during the day, and as the whole solar system moves through different astronomical environments? To find that out, one would look, look at the day-by-day -day measurements from different labs and see if the errors or so-called errors are correlated. I've spent more than 10 years trying to persuade metrologists to do this, and they simply will not, because they say it's a constant, so there's no point looking for variations. But I say, you've got these huge differences, and they say, oh, they're just errors. It's hard to measure. But they simply won't do it. An exercise in open science would be if they put their raw data with the dates online, and then there could be an, uh, uh, anyone could try and look for patterns, and there could be a website where they're discussed. I think it would cost nothing, and we might find something out. We'll find out nothing by pretending it's fixed. Um, there are, in fact, already papers that suggest diurnal variations in, in accordance with the sidereal day. Uh, a group at MIT recently found a daily variation and there's some evidence of annual variations, but there may be other wilder fluctuations uh, that happen in concert. I myself think the so-called physical constants may vary from time to time, in, uh, possibly even chaotically, within certain limits. But I think the day may come when, in scientific periodicals like Nature, there'd be a page a bit like the stock market reports, you know, <laughs> this week's value of the constants, you know. <laughs> This week, the G was slightly up. The charge on the electron held steady. There was a drop in the fine structure constant. You know, um, and, and if that were ca the case, then it would give varying qualities of time when different things could happen. The idea they're all rigidly fixed is a hangover from an old platonic point of way, uh, way of thinking.